So uh, it's always very funny when I hear this, Sean Stone converted to Islam, and I keep telling them the same thing I told them in Iran. I did not convert to Islam. You cannot change, you cannot convert if you maintain the same God. I did not change gods. What I did was I accepted Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet, the last prophet. <laughs> I like that sound. Uh, I wish, yeah, I have to learn uh, Arabic <laughs> and Farsi too. But uh, it's an acceptance of Islam, which is to say, you know, I come from a Jewish bloodline, partly, uh, baptized in the church, Protestant, and accepted the Muhammad. But what the point is that I want, I hope that people understand that we're coming into a new age of, of engagement between each other. And the, the, the problem that I've seen across many countries is the, uh, the, the way that, uh, the, the way that people basically, they categorize themselves. They put up stereotypes and they put up borders around what is possible and impossible. And they forget that ultimately, as the Old Testament says, all man is created in the image of God. And so really, what does that mean? That we are here, all of us, as different colors, different shades, different aspects of that one creator. And the more we can actually rep recognize the creator within each other and respect our fellow man as such, that is, our, that is how we give thanks to God. That is how we praise God. And so the religious practice is a formality, as we know. We are Shia. I accepted Shia Islam because I love Imam Ali, I love uh, Imam Hussein, Ashura, uh, and I love the, I love the fact that the Shia of the <laughs> I just got You know, I think the Shia are the last of the Mohicans, I call it. <laughs> it's it, truly, I, I participated in the, one of the, the uh, songs of Ashura when I was in Iran last, and the beating of the chest, and this amazing energy that we created in, uh, in giving honor to the sacrifice. Because that's what the Shia are about. They stand for the oppressed. They stand for the, for the, the, common, per the common man against empire against tyranny. We don't submit when a Yazid or a Caliph tells us to. And that's what we need in the world. And that's frankly why even before accepting Islam, my friends who are Shia always said to me, you know, they fear us. They really do. And who, who did he mean? He means the empire, the satanic empire that rules the world. And we can get into that. <laughs> um, but they fear the power of faith. And it's something that you have to earn. It's not something that you can simply claim. You can't simply stand and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, I'm a Muslim. I have the right, you know, by claiming that, to execute you, to tell you what to do, to tell you what to wear, to, to what to think. That's not your power. God does not empower you to do that. The humility is of Islam is to submit yourself to God, to rectify yourself and be able to say, I stand in relationship to my maker and I answer, to him, and if I can be an image and a model for others to follow, then I'm in the tradition of Shiism. I'm in the tradition of Imam Hussein, who dies, as, who dies, takes upon himself the sacrifice, not as an aggressor, but, in, but being aggressed, his people being terrorized his, and, and being threatened with death. He says, I will, be, I will do what is just, what is righteous, which is the sacrifice myself. And that's the model that we should follow. This is the nature of Islam to me. It's finding, it's, it's being a model citizen, a model human being, and standing for the, for the rights of the oppressed in this world we live in. But the problem, I will, start, I will start with this. I will start with my personal path, which is to say through faith. How do you earn faith? How do you find faith? You can't simply be, you know, you can be born into a religion, you can be born into the world and say that you have, you know, you believe in something, but you don't know what. How do you find, how do you find God? 
In my case, it was probably in abandoned mental hospitals. It was in uh, one place particularly called House of the Damned. It was an old house in Letchworth Village, which was a mental hospital for kids. And this place was known as House of the Damned because legend had it that a Catholic priest used to systematically kidnap, rape, sacrifice, satanically, young children from this mental hospital. And there were about 20 or 30 kids that were killed in this way. This was done, this was a known legend in that area. It took place probably 40 or 50 years ago, maybe 60. But the house, we wanted to explore it. We wanted to find out for ourselves if, if it was haunted, what lived there. Well, this world becomes the subject of a film I made called Greystone, and inshallah, documentaries to come about it. Because we face their demon possession. I've seen people transformed, you know, demons, jinns, took possession of them, screaming. They, they lost coherence, they lost possession of their, of their bodies. We walked into the house one night on Valentine's Day, 2010. Myself and my friend Alex, who's also a Shia, uh, Lebanese. And all we had was faith. We had no idea what we were walking into. We had candles. We were going to pray for the souls of the dead. And as we walked to this house, we heard demons. We heard laughing. We heard children screaming. Alone, abandoned house. Howling of wolves. And we kept going on, staying focused. Say, look, we're here to pray. And we, that's all we did. We walked to, through the house. We put down three candles, lit them and prayed for the souls of the children. Meanwhile, demons are laughing and howling, mocking us. But I did, we didn't fear it. We walked through it, we got out, and a few months later that house burned down. It wasn't my doing, but there was a, there was, there was a justice to it. God acted. You have to have faith that God will always act as he wills. But you have to have first have that faith, you have to have that prayer. We prayed for the souls of the children. I think that the souls of the children that were harmed there were released from that place. I believe that the jinns that lived there were exiled. Hopefully they were returned to heaven. But the point is that by going through this path, by facing what is unknown, the only thing you have is the light of your consciousness, the faith in your heart, the ability to carry into these dark places and know that you have a principle to stand upon. Because really, at every moment, we're dealing with the unknown. This is all practice. This is training. You know, you don't have to go look for jinns. You don't have to go into haunted houses to do it. But it's one form of training. It's what, you know, in a sense, it's what Hezbollah does. It's a, it's a, it's a training to find your ability to face what you don't know. Every day now, we're facing a future we don't know. Every moment we can be struck down. Any moment we can be taken from this earth, any moment the economy will collapse completely, we could hit hyperinflation, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, destruction, death. Much of this is prophecy. Much of this may come this year, next year. In any case, we have to face death. It's part of life. But what gives us the courage to carry on? What gives us the seed of the idea that there is a future beyond. And I think that comes from the principle of faith. You see, we live in very dark times. I think everyone knows it. For me, it hit in 2009 in a very particular way, where I said, this is the end of history. Quite literally, it's the end of history as we know it. We were about to, this is right at the, maybe it was 2008, 9, right at the cusp of the economic collapse. Those of us who paid attention to this stuff knew it was coming. But end of history meant something else. It meant that we're entering a new phase of reality, where the world that you assume is normal and ordinary may not be that way tomorrow. The stock market that you think is, you know, will survive could collapse. The housing market, all these, these, these are just very, these are various glimpses of the material collapse taking place around us, but it's, it's, a, it's evidence of something much bigger. It's evidence that we're hitting a transition point in the world. We don't have to rely upon the dictates of old, what the empire tells us, this is the way you should live. 
This is the way you should think. Because frankly, they have no principle. That's why you look around, what do you see? What kind of culture do you see? What kind of insanity and madness do you see? I'll give you an example. Look at Rihanna's video, s and this, this is now common morality. Rihanna, who's a product of the Illuminati, she's Jay-Z's apprentice. Personally, I have some information about that. But the point is that she's basically bought into it as to, as to be an object, an idol of worship, as most of these people are. They've created an iconic, iconic culture, which is complete heresy. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. It's heretical to put people up as idols. They're not gods. Why do you give them your energy? Do they transform you? Do they uplift you? Rihanna's s and video, she puts blatantly in, in front of you Princess of the Illuminati on one of the uh, reporter's notepads. The whole video is about how sex is bestial, it's homoerotic, it's heterosexual, it's s and it's about pain as pleasure. The whole song is about pain being pleasure. This is normalcy. This is now made normal. Your children will grow up watching this. Your children will grow up thinking this is the normal way of behavior. This is the way we should be. There's no principle. There's no morality. There's no love. It's, 19, it's 1984 meets Brave New World. And if you can't handle it, take drugs. Don't pray. If you can't handle it, you're going to face the Hunger Games. You're going to have to fight to survive and kill each other. But no one prays in that film. No one actually talks of God. No one talks about the moral consequence of murder. Because they're kids. They don't know any better. But we're adults. We're supposed to be smarter. We're supposed to be more mature. We're supposed to be elevating our people. Why do we treat them as, all, as children? They're too, they're too ignorant to know better? Well, that's why we have principle. That's why we have to stand upon the principles of our faith, of our religion, and beyond the principle of the religion. You know, it's not the letter of the law, as Christ always talked about, the spirit of the law. It's not about persecuting someone because they work on the Sabbath. It's not about persecuting them because they don't wear hijab. But you can educate them. You can tell them, you can lead them and give them a, an opportunity to understand why their path may be wrong. You don't have to persecute them. But we're in, a, in an age now where human rights, human rights doesn't mean the right to build a city, the right to dream of a future, to industrialize, to have, to have a higher order of energy than oil, right? To, to, to dream of traveling to Mars, to dream of space. That's not our human right. Our human right is to prostitute ourselves. Our human right is to steal from our neighbor. Our human right is greed. That's, that's what they call freedom. You see now why it's satanic? The, the, the satanic impulse is your human right is not the freedom to create, to build. It's the freedom to destroy. It's the freedom to take. So they've created a, a satanic empire. And it's now in its last glimpse. You're going to see, we're going to see in the coming years a world that only God can dream of. Maybe the Hadith is predicting it. Maybe there will be madness in cities. Maybe there will be earthquakes and destruction. And maybe half the world's population will die. Many people think this. Personally, I have more faith. I have more faith in God. I have more faith in Mehdi, the power of light to transform, the power of consciousness to heal, the power that at any moment as human beings, we can simply say, no, we don't accept your standard. We don't accept your norms. We will not go along. We will resist. I made a, a, a video to impeach Obama on principle. Without he's impeached, it's not my power. All I can do is try to educate some American citizens as to why he's, as to the fact that he's violating the Constitution and why I think he's violating the Constitution. If every American citizen doesn't watch that video, what a shame, what a loss, what apathy. And then we wonder what, why, what comes will, will come. What, 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 will, what will come is, is going to be a cause of humans. God is measuring every one of us. I believe that at this moment we choose our alignment. If our alignment is to create, it's towards the, beautiful, the, the ennoblement of man, to the recognition of God in man. God will see that. 
He knows it already. The Mehdi is already choosing his sides. He's, he's pulling his army. All we can do is stand here and offer a hand of light, of knowledge, of information, of principle. And those who will reject it, if they're lost, you know, that is their loss. As we all know, it's not the Shia tradition to murder people. That's Wahhabi, Salafi, that's, you know, that's, uh, it's a satanic tradition. So we need to do multiple things. On one hand, I want to try to do projects like Ashura, to try to educate people about what is Shiism, what is the principle of Hussein Ali, the principle of helping your fellow man, ennobling him. On the other hand, I think we have to just teach people that God is very real and present. And it's not for, their, it's not for the sake of my soul that I'm going to try to save people. It's for the sake of mankind, for our future. It's for the sake of their own souls. I was told in, uh, in Iran by one of the top jinn masters there that he believes Mehdi showed himself for the first time in 2006 in the invasion of Lebanon, the 33-day war. Because no one expected Israel would lose that war. No one would have predicted it. The Israelis had planned it for, for months, if not years. How could they not even go a kilometer into that country? But then you start to hear reports. This is very interesting. And I heard this from multiple sources, some from Lebanese, some from the Iranians. A fire flying from the sky, fireballs from the heavens. When there'd be two men, you know, Hezbollah oftentimes one or two men teams. They'd be running at tanks and all of a sudden, fire from heaven would launch and destroy whole tanks. The Israelis would flee. There were many reports of Israelis with their arms severed, clean from swords. When it was analyzed, the wounds were indicating swords that were a thousand years old. Are these signs of the return of the Mehdi? The Jinn masters think so. I think so. Because I remember that very well when that invasion took place. And I remember how the consciousness, in my, at least from my consciousness, shifted. And I realized this is World War III. This is 2006, we're going into World War III, this is it. But something activated, and I remember consciously praying against it, consciously trying to envision light, consciously trying to project the best. And I think the best, the best results followed. Lebanon was, was kept independent, Israel backed, up, backed, up, backed out, it was a proclaimed draw, but Mehdi won, the light won. But I say this to say simply, in my consciousness, I believe I participated through prayer, through, through my prayer, through my intention. I think that I had a, a, an effect. If every human being can understand that, the first hadith is what? What is your intention? Do you intend for the best? That's what this whole reality is based upon. It's our intention. If we intend for the betterment of man, if every human being starts to wake up and intend this, to pray for it, to activate themselves, the world will change. These sat Satanists have no power. The reason the Wizard of Oz is an old man is that he's the, the bomb, the Frank Baum, the writer, is telling you the truth. These people have a great voice, they're great manipulators, they have illusions, they have tricks, they have magic tricks, just like in Pharaoh's court. But if they're so strong, why are they hiding? If they're so strong, why don't they come out and say their intention? Why do they have to manipulate? So this is the time. I believe it, 2012, this is the time. This is the time of awakening. You have Occupy Wall Street, you have movements uh, you know, sprouting up. The people are not happy. They know that their system is collapsing. You can do something very simple. I mean, Glass-Steagall, for example. Very simple measure. Why hasn't the government passed this by now? This, was, this would simply protect depositors' money from the investment banks that are speculating with our money. They're playing with our money without our permission. We don't know what they're doing with it. Why don't you create a firewall and simply protect, go back to the old way, up until 2000. Why don't you do that? Why doesn't the government do it? 
because they want to collapse the system. They want world war. They want martial law. They want destruction because they'll profit from it. They think they will. And they probably have even more nefarious means and reasons. But what we can do is spread light, which is consciousness, which is love. Prayer is one aspect. Participation, educating ourselves, educating our fellow man. That's the greatest sword we have. The great sword of Ali is our ability to speak, to communicate, to learn and transmit that. And then God will have his way with us. You know, what do we have, what do we have to fear, right? So long as our intentions, our prayers are pure, we have nothing to fear. So that's my, my message. This is an age that they want you to believe is terrorizing, it's, fe it's fearful, apocalypse is coming. But the apocalypse is an amazing, amazing experience. It's the unveiling. It's the unveiling of consciousness if we choose to see. If we choose to understand that really the power structure is crumbling and the power always bel belonged with us, with every one of us human beings. It's only upon our work, upon our sweat, that this whole creation exists. As God said, he made this existence for man. He did not make it for a few. He didn't make it for the jinns. He made it for man. So at any moment we choose to take it back, we take responsibility as Christ, as every prophet, as Muhammad, every prophet has taken responsibility for mankind. And that is our obligation, to take responsibility and have faith. And, and inshallah, you know, that's all we can say. God always will do as he wills.